Hey humans, it's Hannah. Welcome back to the second channel. On this channel, I read your personal scary stories that you send into me via email. If you have a scary story that you would like to submit, please send it. It's always in the description. All the info is in the description down below. Taylor always puts it right here. Taylor's my lovely editor. And yeah, I have nothing else to say. Let's get right into it today. Other than the fact that please subscribe to this channel. This is all we do here. So it's just a reliable channel to get some background noise. You can kind of listen to it like a podcast if you want to. Or a lot of people say they do like arts and crafts while they're listening. So yeah. Okay. I'm really excited for the first story. So let's get right into it because I really want to read this one. Okay. Story one for today. This is a doozy, but tied to a relatively big case with receipts and has some potentially significant implications. I have copies of the live journal, some emails between the convicted and I, as well as my emails with the detective on the case at the time that I am happy to share with you to prove that I am telling the truth and not making this shit up. Trigger warning for SA, torture, murder. FYI to everybody for those trigger warnings, please skip to the next story if those are not great for your mindset to listen to right now. Hi, Hannah. I've been watching your channel for the last couple of years and I love your content. I love the relationship you have with your fans and I also really appreciate the care and respect you show the victims in the real life stories you share. Thank you. I have a close call experience to share with you. I won't go into too many details of the crimes involved because this is about my experience and those are very easy to look up, but I'll try my best to give a short summary for context. Have you ever heard of or covered the Brittany Kilgore murder? I might be saying Brittany's last name wrong. Kilgore? That's a terrible last name to have in a true crime story. The headline summary is 22-year-old abducted, tortured, and murdered in fetish killing by BDSM couple and their live-in slave. The longer summary is that Brittany Kilgore was a young, beautiful woman who was loved by many and had her whole life ahead of her. It was tragically stolen by three depraved and sadistic people who had been, up to that point, well known in their local BDSM scene as reputable and safe players. They are all now serving time in federal prison for kidnapping, torture, attempted sexual battery, and premeditated first degree murder. That's so scary. Sorry. I'm just thinking about how scary that is. And I know I'm not part of the BDSM community, but I have heard good things about them in terms of the fact that they're all like probably more respectful and care more about consent than anybody else in the world. And they know that their community gets like a really bad stigma and reputation. So how fucking annoying must that be for people in that community to have this happen and just add to their stigma. Good Lord. Okay, that was all back in 2012. Back when it was common in the scene, as we called it, to have a scene name, Miss D, as she was known in the scene, and Sir Ivan, also a scene name, were a DS couple. I'm assuming that means dominant submission couple. Ivan was the... Oh, I just should have read on. Ivan was the dominant and D was either his slave or his submission. I can't remember specifically. Their real names are Dorothy and Lewis. Jessica, her real name, was their house slave. She came into the picture after I left, so I never met her. Okay, this is a little confusing, but I think what this person is saying is that there was a DS couple, Sir Ivan and Miss D, a.k.a. Dorothy and Lewis. Is that right? So Dorothy is Miss D and Lewis is Sir Ivan. Am I getting that correct? And they were the main couple, the DS couple, and then they had Jessica as a third. Yes, today I am here to tell you the story of how I met D and Ivan and what I consider to be a close call I had with one of them one night several years before they committed their horrible crimes, as well as a possible troubling implication. Oh my God, I am so scared and excited for this story. Like I'm devastated that it involves actual tragedy, but like this might be one of the most bananas stories I've ever received in my email before. Okay, oh my gosh. In 2008, I was a 21 year old, young, beautiful, humble brag woman, loved by many with my whole life ahead of me. 
Same eye color as Brittany. Same height, same hair color, same body shape. D and I met on a very popular BDSM site at the time, callerme.com. I was a submissive interested in dominant men, but being a generally very open person who will make friends with anyone, when she initiated contact, I responded in earnest. What I think I remember is her commenting on some of my pics and me on a mission to make everyone in the world love themselves, replying with a compliment on a couple of her photos, after which point she messaged me and started a conversation under the context of wanting to be friends. At least it started that way. I know at some point Dee floated the idea by me of playing with her and her master, Sir Ivan. I had precisely zero interest in doing that. For one thing, I had no desire to share playmates with anyone else in a single session and for another I was not even remotely attracted to her (laughs) the thought of her touching my body or having to touch her repulsed me (laughs) great okay before we move on I have to look up pictures of these people that's Jessica there's Lewis aka Ivan and there's Dorothy aka D I can see why you weren't attracted to her sorry I'm not really that sorry about calling, I mean, people that murder people are just ugly, both inside and out. I don't care what they look like. They're ugly people from then on. So maybe your instincts were just buzzing at you and telling you not to, I don't know. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like maybe something deep inside of you was just telling you that this was not a good person. Anyway, okay. But back then, my biggest fear in life was hurting someone else's feelings and I didn't know how to say no. Those qualities had landed me in terrible situations in the past, but I hadn't yet outgrown them. I was able to skirt around this proposition by informing her truthfully that I had a Dom dominant and would have to run the possibility by him. At some point in us talking over the course of a few months, Dee had laid out a honey trap of enticing me with a job opportunity to meet her somewhere public. I was young and poor with no college degree or any other type of qualifications, and she was promising me legitimate salary money. I met her at a coffee shop. I was a bit taken aback by the presence of her dom there with her. We never talked about him being there, but I tried to play it cool, even though there was something about him that made me feel slightly uneasy. See, red flags in your instincts are already going off. Of course, I wrote it off as me just being silly. Boy, was I naive. It terrifies me to think about just how naive I was at the time that I met those two. I remember Ivan had stood in line and gotten us drinks while Dee and I sat outside on a patio. When he came and gave us our drinks, he sat down and leaned back in his chair with one leg crossed over the other and he had an expression on his face I had never seen before in my life. And I am happy to report that I have not seen it since. He was looking down at me. Like he knew something I didn't and was feeling very smug about it. I wish I had the words to describe the way it looked and made me feel. See, it's your instincts. The red flags are popping off. This is what I'm saying. You don't have to like be able to describe it perfectly. It's like when people say they're in I Survived stories, how their attacker, their eyes are just black. Like these people can sometimes look as evil as they are. Anyway, but I did my best to make polite conversation, engaging with them the way I would any new friends with openness and giving the benefit of the doubt. Trust first. Dee told me about the ranch they were dreaming of buying to build a giant dungeon there and throw grand Bia DSM parties. To me, it sounded like Disneyland for kinky adults. I was mesmerized. She really knew how to sell. After that day, we chatted some more online about the job opportunity. I can barely recall the specifics, but from what I remember, it was something to do with conducting virtual trainings for Verizon. Dee was talking to her supervisor about hiring me on. She even sent me forwards of her email correspondence with them, though in retrospect, it could have been faked. I never saw an actual email address. She told me that I would have to get the training manual from her because I needed to pass a test for the job. I agreed to meet with Dee again, alone this time, as in no Ivan to my relief. She told me that she was living on a boat in the SD Harbor and we could spend the evening on the boat drinking wine and chatting away. It sounded like fun, to be honest. I thought Dee was my friend and I really wanted that job, so I agreed. I don't think, yeah, it sounds like you're judging yourself for going, but that does sound really fun. Like, you think you met a new friend and they want to go on a boat and drink wine? Like, everybody, like, that sounds like a perfectly 
normal thing to agree to. Just saying. It was about dusk when I got there. I called her from the docks and she came and walked me over to her boat. We spent a bit of time above deck, which was cool. Then when it got dark, she invited me to go down, down below deck to her cabin. I'd never been below deck on a boat before. I didn't know what to expect. I said yes. We climbed down into a tiny cramped living space. It was definitely nicer above deck and I instantly regretted the decision to go down. She bored me with a long talk about her health problems, which she had gotten from drinking only distilled water. That's random. Then the topic of conversation shifted to the dungeon slash ranch. Dee told me that she and Ivan were closing on a property and showed me some of the pictures of it. She shared with me how they wanted to have a live-in slave and how they would have to sign a contract with the whole set of rules their slaves would have to follow, which included eating out of a dog bowl and being restricted on wearing clothes and needing to ask permission to go to the bathroom. I, again, had absolutely no interest whatsoever in being their house slave. In addition to the obvious reasons I listed before, mainly that I was not attracted to her, I would never effing ever consent to someone else deciding when I go to the bathroom. WTF. The topic of playing with Ivan was brought up again. He made me feel uneasy, but I always wanted to give the benefit of the doubt, so I convinced myself that it added to his mysterious charm. Even so, I was happy in my current dynamic with my own dom, but I entertained the idea with her. Okay, I get, sorry, because I'm not part of this community and I don't know anything about it, I'm starting to understand more that you went on to that message board, like that community message board chatting site as just a way to find friends and connect with other people in the same community. Like it's not necessarily that you're going to find hookups or situationships and stuff like that, right? Like romantic partners and other partners. Like I'm sure some people do it on there, but it seems like you were just going there to find other people in the community since obviously it's not something that we openly talk about very often. And you have your own relationship. You have a dom and you're a sub. Okay. In retrospect, this next part makes a lot more sense than it did to me for years after. Dee was supposedly a very jealous person, and it was proposed that Dee, who was ultimately the mastermind behind everything, was jealous of Brittany to the point of planning and committing torture and killing her. At one point in our conversation below deck on a boat at night, secluded, with no one else around, Dee pulled out a big-ass knife. It was either a butcher knife or a hunting knife. Big blade. Oh my god. A long, awkward-ass moment passed with Dee sort of just playing with it in her hands. Was she talking? Was I talking? I could not tell you. The whole vibe had suddenly shifted, and all I could focus on internally was the weird, soft expression she had on her face looking at me while she toyed with a knife big enough to kill me. This is terrifying. The next thing I remember is going back above deck. I don't remember if she went first or whose idea it was even. I'm pretty sure I was putting all of my effort into denying the reality that D had pulled a fucking knife on me with any ill intentions and I continued to conduct myself like a cool clueless little cucumber while keeping her talking and acting like I thought she was the most badass person I had ever met. If there's one way into a narcissist's heart, it's flattery. I honestly wonder sometimes if my ability to kiss ass and feign interest saved my life that night. I am wondering that as well. Above deck, Dee wove a very colorful, very obviously fake story about her upbringing in Haiti, being raised by missionaries and having five siblings, adopting a son at age 12, living in a four-story house with coconut trees, banana trees, and mint, building a pirate ship, jungle gym, four stories high, and swinging from her balcony to the pirate ship, LOL. I ate it up because it was comforting after the jarring experience I had just had below deck, I'm sure. I just desperately wanted to go back to the reality where I was with my friend who was good and my friend and who definitely didn't want to kill me. I wrote about it on my live journal when I got home. In it, I mentioned that I was shaking the entire 40 minute drive back home. At the time, I chalked it up to fear of the ocean and being afraid of getting on and off boats, which, okay, yeah, getting on and off boats has always made me feel a bit wigged out, but I used to go to my grandparents' boats every summer growing up and didn't spend the drive back to their house shaking. Nah, girl, that was your entire body vibrating with red flags. That was your entire body telling you that something was not right. 
As far as a fear of the ocean, okay, past me, sure. That must be why you always went to the beach multiple times per year and loved playing in the waves from age 10 to 18 because you were so afraid. But must also be why you went snorkeling at age 15 and since then your number one bucket list item has been scuba certified and why you love to go snorkeling in Catalina for your birthday every year you can because you were just so very afraid of the ocean lol the mind is truly a wonder and denial is a real thing yes yes it is it's a defense mechanism though it's a survival instinct like you are safe then your brain is trying to reassure you that you were never in danger because if you really admitted that you were while you were still so close to the incident, you might have a panic attack or some other shock or do something else impulsive. Like I honestly think that it is a uh, defense mechanism. I never met with Dee in person again after that night, despite multiple attempts on her end to get me to do this or that with her. After it became clear the job offer was never going to be followed up on, I just stopped replying at some point and she stopped reaching out. I have no doubt that that job was completely fake and she was just doing it to gain trust and to also make you more enticed to meet up with her because there was money involved and she knew you needed money. Like she was preying on your vulnerabilities for sure. That is, until November 2011, I see that I have a missed call in voicemail, and it's from Dee. She suddenly needs the training manual that is three years old back from me. November 2011. Three years since last content. Six months before they killed Brittany Kilgore. Oh, God. Of course, I immediately reached out to the homicide line as soon as I heard the story and the arrests. Suddenly, Dee's call to me made sense. It sent a chill up my spine, thinking of what her true intentions must have been in contacting me. I spoke with the lead detective and told him about that night, as well as the ranch. The ranch in Fallbrook is where they did it, making sure to point out similarities physically between Brittany and I. I shared all of my email correspondence that I could find between Dee and I. I shared my live journal entry. I think what I told him helped the prosecution prove what a conniving, manipulative person Dorothy is. I'm glad I did what I could to help put her behind bars, which is better than what she deserves for what she, Ivan, and Jessica did to poor Brittany, who wasn't even a BDSMer. She just wanted some help moving. What the fuck? A couple of things continue to haunt me about this experience. First of all, it is clear that Dee and Ivan were trying to prey on girls like Brittany as far back as 2008 when I met them. At the time, Dee lived on a boat. Ivan and Jessica dumped Brittany's body at Lake Skinner, a body of water. Ivan had gotten Brittany into his car under the guise of a dinner cruise. They were so sloppy about disposing Brittany because it was their first time, or had they done this before and the reason they were so sloppy is because Dee no longer had their boat. She told me she planned to sell it when they moved to Fallbrook. Secondly, apparently, when Dee manipulated Jessica into giving a false confession in a note, Jessica was found with her throat slit. Apparently, Dee had a long-standing fantasy of slitting someone's throat. Yeah, no shit. Is that what she was thinking about when she was smirking at me with that knife in her hand? Probably. <laughs> Edit. I should have included this somewhere as I think it is more evidence of Dee's intentions towards me. I mentioned that Dee told me she was recruiting a live-in house slave. I also mentioned Jessica, who ended up filling that role. It seems important to me to point out that Jessica looks nothing like Brittany or I. She is an obese woman closer in age and looks to Dorothy. Her face looks like the actor who plays Peter Pettigrew in Harry Potter. I saw a picture of her and yeah, she does. I am pointing this out not to be petty or mean, but to clearly delineate the type physically of person she actually ended up keeping as her slave who had the privilege of staying alive for years until Dee decided she would be more useful dead. In sexually motivated rapes and murders, physical type of the victim can be very relevant and it is likely that Dee did not feel threatened by Jessica. I Yeah, I agree with you. Thank you if you read my story. It felt cathartic just to get it out. Other than the fact that I'm crying because what the fuck? Okay, so here's some email proof from the sheriff's department just to show proof and everything. I just want to be very clear that I don't think that Brittany... Why am I crying? Oh my God. I read stories like this all the time. I know that you were like, your whole body was telling you all these red flags and your instincts were telling you to get out and it probably saved your life. 
I just want to be very clear that I don't think that Britney did anything wrong or that Britney uh, should have done this or that or that she didn't have these instincts or anything. She very well could have had these instincts. She could have seen the red flags too. And the second she saw them, she was like, oh my God, this is terrible. I need to get out of this situation. And perhaps they manipulated her in or she was just too polite to listen to her instincts or you know, that you, quote unquote, got away, which I believe is really what happened here is that you got away and you survived. But then because you got away, like they didn't make the same mistake again, if that makes sense. Like they were probably more forceful with the victim they actually wanted to take. And they were kind of like testing the waters with you. I just want to be very clear that I'm not victim blaming Brittany whatsoever because she didn't do anything wrong, but I can't stop crying. I can't stop crying. I don't know why this makes me so emotional. I think just because you were so close, like because you were in it and I just, I have so much empathy for how much trauma that must have caused you from this and just how it couldn't have caught anybody before Britney was then taken, you know? And I don't mean that to say like, you should have done anything. Like you didn't know and nothing, and they didn't do anything to you. Like you had no reason to report anything. So it just, yeah. Okay. I gotta move on. I gotta move on. Thank you for that story. That was very harrowing and I'm going to be thinking about it the rest of the day. Let's move on to story number two. So, hi, Hannah. I low-key believe my house is haunted and get small experiences all the time, but this completely unrelated story is even more convincing to me, and I wasn't even there. This happened a few years ago to my mother, who's quite religious and skeptical. I may get some terminology wrong, as I'm not very well-versed in this specific area of the paranormal. For a little bit of context, my grandfather passed away around seven years ago, and I think he was older than 90 and suffering from Alzheimer's. I was 13 at the time and didn't remember what he was like before his Alzheimer's became really bad. He passed after falling down his cellar stairs. Oh my God, that's really sad. My mom is at a party with her friends, which happens to have a medium doing readings with spirits. She has already talked with some people at the party about their loved ones, but being a skeptic, my mom saw everything as being very vague and unconvincing. The medium moves on saying she's getting something about a fall and asks if this sounds familiar to anyone in the room. So of course my mom raises her hand along with several other people. The medium goes on to say that the spirit has a connection with coins and asks again if that is relevant to anyone. The only hand that remains up is my mom's. My grandpa loved coins. He had a drawer full of spare change and rolls, had at least one quarter from every state, and even gave my brother, cousins, and I quarter books so we could collect state coins when we were kids. I still have mine to this day. Aww. My grandpa told the medium that he loves us all and is always watching over us. He also said that this was the first time he is happy now. So my mom came home. She was visibly shaken up and on the verge of tears as she told us the story. To this day, she's more open to the paranormal and still hasn't let that night go. Thank you so much for reading this, E. She, her. Thank you, E. That's a really, really cool story. That's kind of bananas, though. Is it possible? Just like double checking, though. I'm always suspicious of people that claim to be mediums. Like if they do Google searches, if they got your mom's name, did the medium possibly Google your mom before she went to the house and then kind of saw the story or found his obituary and found out how he passed away? And in the obituary, it said he loved coins. Like, I'm really sorry to be skeptical. I don't want to ruin anything for you, but I'm always suspicious suspicious of that. But this does make a really, really, really convincing story if she didn't know who was going to be at the party and didn't know anybody at the party or anything like that. So yeah, still very interesting. All right, the third story for today starts, Hi, Hannah. I just finished watching your second scary story video, so I decided to reach out with one of my own. My name is Marvin, and I don't mind you using it in the video, and I was reminded of this story by one of the ones in the video mentioned above. That being said, trigger warning for school shootings or mention of them at least. Just heads up for everybody, school shootings. This happened during my junior year of high school, if memory serves. I had just left the girls' bathroom, I'm a trans boy, by the way, on the second floor of my high school to head up to the third floor for my Italian class. Our lunch period had just ended. Immediately after opening the bathroom door, I got an uneasy feeling in my stomach. The five minutes between the end of lunch and the first afternoon class of the day always 
had the hallways packed, noisy, and bustling, with the classroom doors almost all opened. All of the doors were shut, and there wasn't a single person in the hallway. Naturally, my silly little teen Bren went, ha ha, whoa, Silent Hill. And I just went to the staircase. (laughs) When I reached the door to my Italian class, the pit in my stomach grew as I tried the knob. It was locked. Immediately then I knew that we were having an active shooter drill. I hadn't heard the announcement because there weren't speakers in the bathroom, even though there really should have been for times like this. Quickly, I ran back to the girls' bathroom, not knowing what else to do. There were two sophomores in there that I didn't know who were just as confused as me. I told them we were having a drill and decided to lock ourselves in each of the stalls in the bathroom. Thankfully, there was three. Now, our school never really told us what to do if we were out of the classroom during these drills, so we were all just guessing and hoping that we were doing the right thing. I was sitting on the floor of this nasty bathroom, sketchbook in my lap as I started to draw to pass the time. I figured these only last 10 to 15 minutes. We should hear the bustle of footsteps, maybe even an announcement from the hallway speaker soon. So 10 minutes passed, then 20. My unease began to grow as I realized maybe this wasn't a drill. And right as I thought that, my fucking phone died. My crappy little Samsung that could barely hold a charge to last through the school day that could probably cook an egg whenever I used it. That was my only link to the outside world to my parents dead. Great. It feels like we're in there for hours before there's a harsh knock on the door and a man's voice I don't recognize. Jesus Christ, the SWAT team is here at my high school. I feel obligated to be the one to answer. The two girls were younger than me, so I should be the responsible one, right? I briefly consider it may not be the SWAT team outside, but instead one of my classmates. But the voice doesn't shake and there's a grate on the bottom half of the door that I can kind of see camo out of. So I reply, I open the door slowly as instructed and I see the biggest fucking gun I've ever seen pointed at me. I think I'm like 16 at this time. I'm terrified. I sheepishly ask to grab my backpack, which I know now is stupid, but I was a kid. The man seeing that I'm no threat tells me I can get it later. The other girls come out and we're all led to the gym. I find my friends and pretend like this is just another wacky day, but inside I'm so fucking terrified. Why did this happen? Did someone get hurt or worse? Okay, but you answered the door when you thought maybe there could be an active shooter. I'm not blaming you whatsoever, to be frank. Like, our brain does weird ass things in times of emergency. But I am, it sounds like this was an authority figure, but I'm just like freaking out for you that what if when you saw the gun, it was the gunman and not an authority figure. Oh my God. Okay, I'm panicking for you. I had to dodge news cameras on my way home. The next day, I learned that a sophomore I'd never spoken to made a stupid, edgy joke. Oh, and because of that, we all got traumatized and he got arrested. I felt kind of bad for him, though, especially the next year when he came back. Had to be rough, but on the same note, I was terrified I'd die in the girls' bathroom, which would just be painfully ironic. (laughs) because you're trans that's so funny oh does this count as a near-death experience maybe regardless i hope you enjoyed the story of one of the most terrifying days of my life thanks for reading p.s i did get my backpack back eventually marvin i am (laughs) i'm so sorry that's not funny but it sounds oh but at least there wasn't an active shooter right somebody made a threat and so they locked down the school and had to come and arrest him for being a dumbass and making i'm sorry the the only reason i mean like yes i do think threat should be taken seriously obviously because how many times have somebody ended up being a bad person and people ignore threats or ignore journal entries and stuff. Like, I'm not saying we shouldn't take those seriously. It's just that somebody making a joke about it or saying something like that, like, yeah, they should be taught a lesson. But if they were actually planning on something like that, they probably wouldn't advertise it to the world in that way. Just saying. But I understand why they still had to do something. So still, I have never been like confronted with a gun in my entire life in that way other than just like holding one or seeing one and the thought of opening a door and having a giant gun there I think I would pee my pants okay story for today I think we're only doing five stories for today because the first one was so long 
All right, story four. Hello, Hannah. First off, love your channel immensely. I listen to your videos while I game in my off time, and it's always a good listen. Oh, thank you. For the purposes of this story, you could just refer to me as Phoenix, please, and thank you. This story takes place about 12 years ago at the time of writing this. I had my own car and a job working as a security guard on various shifts. I finished up a shift one day about 11 a.m., drove home, and arrived at about 11.15. My mom was a social worker and it wasn't unusual for us to have guests in the house for various reasons. So when I walked through the back door and saw a man sitting at the table, I wasn't exactly surprised. He was about six feet tall, easily in his 60s, wore a thick cotton suit of gray with a very nice 1940s style hat. I remember the hat especially well as I love that style of hat. I said, oh, hi, I'm Phoenix, my mom's son. He nodded at me as if politely acknowledging me. I continued through the kitchen to my bedroom. And at the same time, my mom walked down the hallway and said, hi, asked how my shift was. I said it was okay and asked who's the guy at the table. She looked at me like I was talking a foreign language for a moment and said, what man? We both went back to the kitchen and sure enough, no man, no hat, just gone. It wasn't like a ghost. I could feel someone in the room, like when you know someone else is there with you, but I can't explain how he got there or where he went. If this gets picked, thank you so much. I will continue to watch your channel. Regards, Phoenix. That's so creepy. What the hell? I don't like that. I don't have too much commentary to add to that one because like you said, it doesn't sound exactly like a ghost. But there's no way it was an intruder, right? Like, unless some man in a top hat just, like, came in an open door and sat down for a few minutes. Maybe he needed a drink, a drink of water and then just left. What the hell? That is so weird. And no one else saw it, huh? Like, your mom didn't see him or anything? Weird. Okay. All right. Here's the last story for today. Hi there. I just wanted to say thank you for reading this for a video or not, because frankly, I love telling these stories. Context. My name is Psyche. I think is how you say it. Um, my name is Psyche. They, them. I'm 20 years old at the time of writing this. These stories happened when I was like seven and then around 12 to 13 years old. I do not typically believe in the paranormal, but I do believe in a handful of cryptids and a good chunk of Native American based creatures. These stories are why. I promise you these are as true as can be, but I understand the disbelief. Apologize for the sheer size of this message. P.S. All names are changed unless it is an online username. Thank you. Appreciate that. The hospital. This story happened one Thanksgiving. We had this tradition of walking down to my grandmother's house to a nearby haunted bronchitis or TB. Can't really remember that detail hospital in Hanson, Massachusetts. It was in terrible condition and had been the site of a few arson attacks years ago. My cousin, I'll call her Curly, she has the prettiest curly blonde hair, and her boyfriend S took us. He, trying to be some big shot, snuck under the fence and cut his head. My brother Jay and I ventured off no more than five, ten feet away from the group, tucked behind these two trees, but otherwise still on the path. My brother and I had been looking up at the rooms when we saw an orb slowly floating through the window. No, none of us had seen anything here before S hurt himself in the years we had been and had gone there. Oh, oh, I see. So like things started happening after S snuck under the fence and cut his head on the fence. Just as we see that, I hear in the distance, in Curly's voice, Psyche! It came from the woods behind me. I poke my head out from behind the trees. Yeah, Curly, but shock or no, Carly never actually called my name. Needless to say, after I explained this to her, we were practically shoved all the way back home. The next story is called White Out. This next story needs further context before I start. I live in a house on top of a hill in Massachusetts, USA, so a lot of snow is commonplace here. This year, there was about a foot of snow on the ground in the middle of April. I was home alone because my brother, the same Jay as before, was at a karate tournament in Rhode Island about a two to three hour road trip. I was on my phone texting an online friend I call Moon when this voice in the back of my head started telling me to look outside, look outside, look outside. My room had two huge windows facing the backyard. Everything was nearly a blinding white from last night's snowstorm. 
I pull myself out from my bed, still in pajamas, and turn to face the window. Outside was a huge mass of all black, looking like terribly matted fur or even a silhouette of some swamp monster. It stood at the same height as my pool, so about eight feet. It was a five foot above ground pool with about three to four feet tall plating all around. It didn't move, didn't look at me, almost like it was turned away from me. And after about 10 to 15 seconds of oh shit going through my brain, I ducked down under the windowsill. Crawling over to my bed, I grabbed my phone, not to take a picture or do anything even moderately intelligent, but to tell my on friend that I was going to go out and see what it is. (laughs) I wasn't a smart child or had much will to live back then, so feel free to blast me in the comments. (laughs) that's great to be fair like I am so bad at taking pictures when I should too like I my first thought is never to pull out my phone and I don't understand how people catch so much on phones as they do nowadays because my first thought is never to take out my phone and take a video or picture it's terrible I don't know my brain just doesn't work that way so no hate for me anyway I don't know you might get some blasts from the comments but not for me I stood up and turned back to the window and instead of that monster being there it was a man this time in all black trying to hop the fence to get out of my backyard My super intelligent, sarcasm, 13-year-old ass turned, headed straight for the kitchen and grabbed the biggest knife in the drawer in a green Tinkerbell nightgown, mind you, and nothing else except a pair of Ugg boots. (laughs) I walked my little butt right outside, knife in hand, to look for footprints. There wasn't any. I got scolded by a very concerned father when I got back and told him what happened. Make of these two stories what you will, but I know what I saw and I know it was something on the scale of paranormal. Have a nice day, Hannah. I hope you enjoyed the read. Wow. Thank you so much. That was some great writing there. I really enjoyed your writing style. And you said your name was Psyche. What I love is that the second story, it feels like it was a shapeshifter. Like, is that kind of what I know that you didn't like you want to leave the conclusion to us and for us to decide. But it sounds like you saw some creature out there. And then when you looked back, it was a man instead, like climbing out of your yard, which would be in line with the cryptid or uh, skinwalkers are particularly known for being shapeshifters as far as I understand. So that's so interesting. I do wish you had to get a picture though. That would have been really, really epic. But again, I totally understand why you didn't. I never blame somebody for not taking a picture or proof because like I said, I myself am terrible at remembering to grab my phone and take a picture. So anyway, I just love the vision of you in a Tinkerbell nightgown and and Ugg boots and walking outside, like ready to take it on, like not just watch it, not call the police, not take a picture of it. Like you're ready to fight. You're, <laughs> you're ready to throw hands. It's pretty funny. Uh, okay, friends, that is going to be it for today. That first story took a lot out of me. Good Lord. I have to go look up more pictures and information about that story because I know nothing about that story. And now I'm really interested in it. So Yeah. Okay. Please like the video and subscribe. Do all those things to help this channel grow a little bit more because the more this channel grows, the more videos I can make on it because right now I'm about breaking even between the small amount of AdSense that this channel makes and me paying an editor, which is I, more than I could ask for. Like, I'm so happy about that. However, if I was making a tiny bit of profit off this channel, just my mindset would be able to put more effort into making more videos, if that makes sense, just so that my time is all worth it and everything. But I, I really hope it gets there because I love making these videos. These are really fun and it's just a nice little uh, mental break from the really hard videos that I make on the main channel. So, okay. Love you all. Thank you for listening slash watching and I'll see you all in the next one. Okay. Bye.